Thank you, Mr. Mooney. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, tonight's going to be a tricky presentation, and I want to apologize immediately to those who have to try to, you know, take down our words. Um, but tonight I'm going to actually try to focus on solutions. Last week I spent an hour behind this microphone begging our friends on the left, begging our Democrat colleagues to stop doing much of what they've been doing because we, we and I demonstrated, it's been hurting people. Last year was miserable for the working poor, for the poor, for the middle class. And, 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 and it's, in some ways it's our own fault in this body because intellectually this place is calcified. It's my word of the day. Because we see the math, we see the facts, we, we have folks lay out what's going to happen, but because it's already part of, particularly in this case, the left's dogma, we do it anyway. And then we act surprised here a year later when my community had 10.9% inflation last year. Year over year, how many people is that crushing? And now we're seeing some data, and this is important. This isn't transitory. A number of the most powerful modelers in the economic world in this country are now starting to ring the alarm bells of both we're heading towards a recession and that inflation may now be with us for a decade because of how we've screwed things up in this place. First, this is as of almost today. You have Goldman Sachs now saying, 27.5% chance of a recession, not a slowdown, a recession, which means two quarters of negative GDP by the end of this year. Um, Citi is at 25%. JP Morgan still at 15, which was the numbers from last week. These numbers have skyrocketed. If you and I looked at this three weeks ago, it was 9%. Does anyone here actually care about people? Do you care about working men and women? Do you understand what a recession does to people? How long it takes to get your feet back underneath you? Let alone the head kick we're giving to the American public with inflation. So here's my goal. I'm gonna race through just a boatload of slides here. And I'm gonna throw out concept after concept after concept. Some of them are marginal. Some of them you're going to go, oh, that makes sense. But the point is there are actually solutions. If the left would ever allow us to have, offer a genuine amendment in committee, to actually have a genuine discussion and debate, maybe we could change some hearts and minds in this place or just even enlighten some intellect around here. But that isn't what this place does. So let's actually start to walk through the bill that a number of folks are so giddy about today, I am fixated on diabetes because of what it does in the misery to parts of my district. I represent a tribal community that is number two as its percentage of population who suffer diabetes. Come to the reservation. I'll introduce you to some families I've known where mom has her feet cut off. But to tout the bill that was passed here today as a solution is an absolute fraud. You do realize the con job that the Democrats are touting here, and, and, I, and, and I'm not sure it's purposeful. I don't think they spent some time understanding. First, you basically created a subsidy bill for Big Pharma. Congratulations. You didn't reduce the price. What you did is you created functionally $20 billion of subsidy to buy down the price of insulin, and you bought it down with a fraud because you're doing a, well, we're going to pretend that the um, Trump administration's um, uh, you know, rule in regards to rebates is in effect, which it was never going into effect. So you made magic money again. And at the same time, you just took away the pressure we could have done together to actually get a real solution to the price of insulin. And some of that solution could have been something as simple as the co-op 
that's in construction right now that is saying they're going to bring $30 a vial, $55 a box, and a box is five vials of insulin to market in a year. So if we were actually doing solutions here, the Democrats' bill, working with Republicans, would have been, we're going to put it at the stack for licensing and permitting. We're going to put aside some money to make sure that they get their factory up and running in Virginia as soon as possible. And oh, by the way, this is substantially less expensive than the subsidized version that's going to cost the society $20 billion, and you're handing that to Big Pharma, which isn't that amusing? You know, I mean, the amusing is the speechifying here and the Democrats' approach to helping people who can't afford their insulin is to blow up the market, screw up the incentives, and then screw up the actual solution. And the solution's coming. Does anyone actually subscribe to something where they read? And you got to understand, we need to go in the whole debate around diabetes, we got to go much, much further. 31% of all Medicare spending is diabetes. 33% of all healthcare spending. Understand, in 29 years, the United States is scheduled to have about $112 trillion of borrowed money in today's dollars. 75% of that is just Medicare. But if 31% of Medicare spending is diabetes, cure it. And you go, but David, how would we do that? Well, I've been to this floor a dozen times over the last 12 months saying the research is happening, the research is being good, the early numbers look good. Guess what? They, it succeeded. Hey, the phase ones worked. Now we're actually on a, another set of phase ones where they're actually using CRISPR to tag the stem cell that's become an isolate cell to make it so it, you can do a biofoundry and it can be a production line so it doesn't even need to come from your skin to get the stem cells. Meaning if we would get our reimbursement sets straight here, our licensing set straight here, our incentives lined up. The modeler is saying in about five years, you could actually be rolling out. The cure to type one is actually the easy part. It's the cure to type two, which is a much diff more difficult. We have to have a brutal conversation of nutrition support and maybe nutrition support that's healthy, encouraging our brothers and sisters in my tribal communities, the lifestyles and things to be ready to actually accept the cure. But the fact of the matter is it is here. So what did the Democrats just do? They did a subsidy bill for insulin. That's going to cost $20 billion. How about if they had taken that $20 billion and put it into almost an X price for getting this cure to market? I mean, it, it, it's, it's just an example. We don't seem to get our heads around the world works as incentives and disincentives. We've made it so bureaucratic, so expensive, that we are in an incumbent protection racket here. And it's not incumbent members of Congress. It's incumbent bureaucracies, incumbent business models, and the disruptions like this that would end so much misery and also be the single biggest thing we can do to affect the debt in this country. We applaud ourselves for voting through a bill that actually will have made things worse if there's an economist in the room and you walk through saying, well, because you just functionally government subsidized this, you just took away the pricing pressure to actually have the revolution of both on the cost and the cure. And I'm begging my brothers and sisters here to think There is this incredible hope. We've already had this, they've already had the successes in the phase ones, and now the ability to actually tag it, make it so you don't need to be on anti-rejection drugs. Think about what it means to the health of the country. And why would I go to diabetes right after showing you that the projections of a recession at the end of this year are skyrocketing? Because if you are heading in an approach where you're making a substantial portion of our population and making them available to participate in the economy, 
Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to throw out a really uncomfortable subject for a second, but I'm the senior Republican on joint economic, and we've been trying a little side project for almost a year. What makes people poor? What's the real cause of income inequality? And unlike the rhetorical crap virtue signaling that's set around here, we're actually starting to find out there's a lot of things, but health, education, things of that nature that, that, that we can affect are actually major precursors. And then you look at the amount of the population that is in the lower quartiles that either they or their family, or because they have someone that's horribly sick, substantially because of renal failure or diabetes. My other side of the argument is why this is moral to pursue. It also would end lots of misery. It would actually really help the poor. It actually might squeeze down income inequality. It's sort of the trifecta. And yet, I will do these presentations on how it works and that it would be amazing for economic growth and if it truly brought more of our brothers and sisters to be able to participate in the economy, it would also be really good for inflation too. And look, um, I've done this slide multiple times of trying to sort of explain the mechanisms of, you know, uh, you know a stem cell and you can now direct, almost like, a, think of it as a, a biofoundry mechanism, sort of like CRISPR. You can direct that um, uh, stem cell to become a insulin producing cell. And in the previous slide, walk through how you can actually do this in a fashion that it can be almost a factory production. So even beyond the personalized medicine concept. And why this is so important is we're on the cusp of a revolution to make people's lives so much better, so much healthier, and instead, what we've done in this place over the last 12 months is we've set off inflation, we've set off crime, we've set off homelessness because of really, really bad policies, lots of great virtue signaling. There have been beautiful speeches behind these microphones telling you how much we care and how we feel, and then the economics are just horrible. So some more of the disruption that I believe would be great for the country, and the technology is already here, we just have to learn to legalize it, is your ability to wear something on your wrist. This is one of my favorites. So I'm just going to walk you through a concept. This is a breath biopsy. A couple versions of this out there think it would be a couple hundred dollars at most, and you could have functionally a medical lab in your medicine cabinet at home. Blow into it. Within a couple moments, it tells you, hey, guess what? You have a virus. It can then bang off your medical records, order your antivirals, and maybe lift, or someone can drop it off at your house in a couple hours. Would that make your life easier? Would that give you more time with your family and faster to get healed? Would it help? crash parts of the health care costs. Remember, three quarters of that $112 trillion is health care. It's Medicare. It's health care is what's substantially bankrupting this country. Do you know what the problem with that technology is? It's illegal. The fact of the matter is you would let this breath biopsy be able to order your antivirals, allow the algorithm, and the data says the algorithm is more accurate than those of us as humans. I know that just hurt a bunch of people's feelings. But if you legalize the technology, you could have a disruption in the price of health care. You could make the society, our country, dramatically more efficient. Give us more time with our families and to be healthy. It would be an economic virtuous cycle and a healthy one. It would just require us around here to actually have to deal with the avalanche of lobbyists that hate this technology. But as I said before, we're sort of calcified intellectually around here, aren't we? So now I want to talk about the heresy 
that's in President Biden's budget and, and the solutions. First off, how many times have you gotten up here and seen the, uh, the speaker herself multiple times? Tax reform in 2017 was for the rich. No, it wasn't. And look, CBO, more revenues came in. I mean, corporate tax receipts leaped 75% after we reformed the tax code a couple years ago. The fact of the matter is what we call receipts and ways and means, revenues as most people will think of, coming into the government went up dramatically. And why that was so important is in 2018, 2019, where our most successful years in modern economic history of poor people getting less poor, the middle class doing better, income inequality shrinking, food insecurity shrinking. Minority populations had the biggest movement ever in U.S. history in getting less poor, getting wealthier, but that income inequality gap shrank because we got the tax incentives correct. But because it was Republicans that did it, there's this running away from it. And, and, and we've seen great, great job, guys. Think about what's happened to this country in one year. You are poorer today than you were one year ago. The fact of the matter is the setting off of inflation. God knows some of the other things have gone on. We're going to touch on them. We are poorer today than we were one year ago. And yes, there was COVID. But we stood behind these microphones a year ago and said, you don't want to keep dumping money the way you're doing. You're going to set off inflation. They told us to go jump in a lake. Congratulations. They did it. And now some of the economists are telling us a recession by the end of the year. Oh, and maybe 10 years of an inflationary cycle before we can squeeze it out of the system. And once again, if you actually look at the charts, it was actually working women that exploded off this, this big a movement here. I know this chart may not express it. That type of steep curve increasing is remarkable. Just remarkable in what happened after tax reform. And it was actually working women, substantially those from minority populations that had just remarkable increases in income. And they're the ones that also got crushed during the way we approached the pandemic. And anyone that tells you, oh, it was a, this huge giveaway of money, well, it's sort of amazing because it was the second and the third highest receipts, revenues, 2018, 2019. And you got to remember, there was a little bit of a con in 2017 because the expensing went in you could expense in the last quarter before the tax reform. So the fourth quarter, 2017, you could begin expensing. So this actually had some of the economic growth effects pulled into the previous year. I know that I'm geeking out a bit. But it continued. One of the reasons we've actually economically held up pretty well is the Democrats haven't been able to repeal the 2017 tax reform. And I know this slide's a little hard to see. It was the best one we could put together in our short time frame. But guess what? We crossed over $4 trillion in revenues and receipts. And if you go back, think of that. It was only a couple years earlier, we were at $3.3 trillion. You're understanding, that's like a $700 billion increase in receipts in a time when the Democrats told us we had eviscerated the tax code and gave it all away. At some point, the calculator does tell the truth. So back to our earlier thesis. Getting the tax system correct is amazing for the economics. But there's the other side of the question I want to ask. How many here believe growth is moral? I will try to argue over and over that economic growth creates opportunity. And those opportunities driven by that growth is moral. And I wish I could just get us to focus on that growth also is a way we survive 
the debt bubble that's expanding like an alligator mouth, where here's the size of our economy and here's the scale of the debt. You do understand, CBO basically says in nine years, every single year, just our interest payment will be $1 trillion. That's where we're, at, we're heading. So here's a crazy thought on if I needed to tap down inflation today, but I wanted to do it by not solely having the Federal Reserve do monetary policy, which is squeezing cash out of the system. Remember, inflation is what? Too many dollars chasing too few goods. Well, you have the monetary side of inflation, pull the dollars out of the economy. The other side is make more stuff. So this year, expensing, and the reality of it, tax reform, it was the expensing that drove much of the economic expansion, the investment in productivity, is goes to 80% this year, or next year. Uh, excuse me, 80% this fiscal year, and then drops down, I think, to 60 the next year. Do a mechanism where you add a bonus. Say, business, if you're willing to take some of that cash functioning out of the system and go invest it in productivity capital, go buy a new plant, go put in new equipment, do things that will make it so you can pay workers more. We make more stuff because if we have more stuff, you knock down inflation because it's now numbers of dollars divided by numbers of stuff. Crazy idea. Do a tax adjustment. Say, we're going to give you a bonus on your expensing to encourage you to take that money out of liquidity and buy things that make us more productive as a country. It's a win-win, and it has the benefit of being a long-term benefit to society. And it's sort of, a, we've been working on this just as a, a thought experiment. And it may not be brilliant, but it's more the concept of, if, it's, if right now today there's too many dollars chasing too few goods, then create a deal with business in America saying, hey, if you'll take some cash, set it aside, functionally escrow it, and you're going to put it into new equipment that makes us more efficient so you can have more goods, better transportation, better supply chains. That's what we want to incentivize instead of trying to buy things today and shove them in a warehouse because you're worried the price is going to go up tomorrow. This is the type of thought experiments policy we should be pursuing if you need to knock down inflation, but you want to do it by growing as an economy. Instead, around here, we're going to sit around on our backsides and let the Federal Reserve basically squeeze us out and put many people through months and months and months of recessionary misery because that's how we're going to knock down inflation. Another part of the thought experiment. I have some new areas, if I'm blessed enough to represent in the coming cycle, and we did some polling, and they came back, crime is their number one issues. I went on a ride along with a sergeant who's actually a friend, and he's showing me neighborhoods saying, you do realize the homelessness in these neighborhoods has doubled in a year, doubled. He's explaining to me that someone now can get high for a fraction of the cost they could a year ago. Every single one of those are what we call knockoff effects, second degree, third degree effects. You all remember your high school economics class? You opened up the borders. What did you think was going to happen? My community of Phoenix is flooded with narcotics. Matter of fact, we just had a bust a couple months ago. There was enough fentanyl to kill every single resident in Arizona. So the compassion that this administration and Speaker Pelosi wanted to show for the border, well, thank you, because you're killing my neighbors. The homelessness. I don't believe the Phoenix market is the only area that's seeing incredible increases in homelessness. The crime. Go on the city of Phoenix's heat map and click, 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 and you can see the expansion of the crime and where it's moving. And the number of overdoses. The fact of the matter is when you screw up a policy, you need to think through the knockoff effects. You screw up the border policy, how much misery did you bring to society? And remember, we've done a number of presentations. 
What are the two ways you make the working middle class or the working lower class poorer? Inflation, well, we're doing a great job at that. And you flood the marketplace with people with similar skill sets. So if you're that individual that may not have finished high school, but you're a good drywaller, and you're busting your backside, and it's hard work. I hung drywall as a young man. We've just flooded the marketplace with people with similar skill sets. Does anyone around here I mean, own a basic economics book? So let's go to a couple other things. So the principle there is get the border policy right, because there's this incredible irony. Legal immigration for individuals with specific talent sets that we actually need in this society. You know, the young man who just got his PhD at Arizona State University and is leaving because the State Department's ability to process visas and the ability to be immigration has functionally become non-existent in the last two years. But over here, a couple million crossed the border. I mean, does anyone see the that's the weird irony of the Democrats' policies of they hurt. I don't think they were meant to hurt. I think they, they, they had the virtue signaling quality of sounding compassionate, but that's not what's happened. So let's actually walk through a couple of things that are actually additional solutions. How many times do we talk about supply chain? And you've seen the latest data. It basically says, and I'm not going to argue with it because I haven't had a chance to break down the numbers. Half of inflation is we spent too damn much money. But half of inflation is second degree knockoff effects in supply chains. So we just did a transportation bill. And the transportation bill was substantially green oriented. Very little of the money actually went to roads and bridges. Um, none of it actually went to disruptive technologies. But there's ideas like this, where this was some SpaceX engineers who are out raising capital to build this, where you would actually have autonomous trains. So you pull a container off, stick it on one of these, the autonomous lorry right underneath it on a track drives it to the warehouse it's supposed to be dropped off at. So if you're telling me we have a crisis in truck drivers in the Alameda corridor outside LA, the ability to use technology. Why didn't we incentivize this sort of thing? But do you want to know what the Democrats chose to incentivize in their Build Back Better? Wasn't creative things to make us more productive as a society. It was ideas like this. In their legislation, it's illegal for the ports to automate. Huh? But they just told us that they were trying to fix the supply chains. Except for the numbers of giveaways to the unions, they put into their legislation that you can't automate the ports. So on one hand, you have breakthrough technology that says we think we have a way to move these containers. And then the next thing that the brain trust around here does policy-wise, but we're going to make it illegal for you to do the automation that would move the supply chains and that you are telling us is half the inflationary spike. Does, there are solutions. Stop putting up these impediments and start embracing the technology to fix the problem. Mr. Speaker, may I ask for my time? Mr. Speaker, may I ask for my time? The gentleman has 29 minutes remaining. 29. 29 minutes. So in the president's proposal, in the Democrats' proposals, they want to tax the rich more. The new President Biden's um, budget, I think, has, what, 36 new taxes in it? But here's the great irony. OK, so they want to do this one tax where they want to Functionally tax unrealized capital or unrealized gains, which is a taking, it will be ruled unconstitutional. But it's an interesting concept. And we want to make a simple proposal that's something both Republicans and Democrats might agree upon. Stop subsidizing the rich. We've come here to this floor a couple times and shown there's $1.4 trillion every 10 years 
that the left subsidizes the rich. And so what do the Democrats do? They say, we need to tax the rich more, okay? And then they put in Build Back Better, you can make $800,000 a year and we're gonna hand you $125,000 of tax credits. Not tax deductions, credits. Does anyone see the lunacy going on here? So the virtue signaling is rich people aren't paying enough. And then over here, we're going to give them a trillion plus dollars in subsidies. And then they're going to add more in their Build Back Better for more rich people to have more subsidies. It, it's just infuriating. Does anyone actually read this stuff? Does anyone own a calculator? And you start to see the number. I have a number of these slides here. And the point is really simple. Policy after policy. If you can afford your fourth, you know, $6 million house on a beach somewhere, do you deserve subsidized flood insurance? But all through this government, there's items like that where we wink and nod, we say we're going to tax rich people more, and then we're handing out massive subsidies. As a Republican, I want to cut spending. You say you want more revenues. Great. Stop putting through the tax code, the regulatory code, these programs, wink, wink, nod, nod, a bunch of subsidies to the people that write checks. So, You've had a number of, particularly Republicans, we've come behind the microphone and said, you canceled Keystone Pipeline. You made it really hard to put new land into production for pulling hydrocarbons out. That's actually not the big thing that the left did. What the left did is things like this, where the Security Exchange Commission is functioning, gonna, is adding new rules that if you invest in hydrocarbons, or you're a pension system, or these, you're going to have to fill out paperwork to explain your effect on global warming. What are your effects on carbon? They functionally did what we call, they screwed up the capital stack. So you could have a natural gas field that was substantially shut down when prices collapsed during the pandemic. It's ready to go, but you need a bunch of capital to put it back into production. And where do you go to get a loan? Democrats did something brilliant. If the goal was to make us much poorer and dependent on foreign countries, hydrocarbons like Venezuela, is they made it so saying, okay, we can do the regulatory side, but that's a little bit obvious. But if we make it so no one can get capital to actually put these fields into production, and that's, they've succeeded. And do not let someone try to con you that what you're paying at the gas pump today, what you had to pay for your heating bill yesterday, happened because Putin's invasion. Natural gas prices exploded last September, October. Do you remember this room being full of people wanting to talk about how we're going to survive the winter heating bills? That was because of this. It didn't just happen. But my proposal is, Okay, I, I'm fascinated with the use of natural gas. Our friends on the left, our brothers and sisters on the left, say, but David, you know, yes, it may burn about half as, you know, half the um, carbon emitting, you know, CO2 emitting as coal, but there's methane. Well, has anyone, let's see if I can find this slide. The technology that's out there to basically gobble up methane. And maybe this works, maybe it doesn't work, but the fact that the technology exists and has been scientifically proven to work, why wouldn't we pursue that saying, if you could get your natural gas out? Because remember, President Biden just promised we're going to ship a bunch of liquefied natural gas to Europe, except we don't really have the production right now and you can't get capital for it and the left is going to protest leakage from, from methane. Well, it turns out you can take clay, a copper oxide, so it's kitty litter. Think about that. It's a cheap solution to absorb that methane. Why wouldn't we bring the brain trust around here and say, 
We need the natural gas, desperately. Some are worried about the methane bleed. Fine. Let's find the solution. Turns out there may be a really inexpensive one. Why wouldn't we invest in this and pursue it? There are solutions. Instead, around here, it's the Malthusian economics of let's just shut it down and see how long people are willing to live in poverty and misery. Transportation bill again. What's one of the most powerful things you can do to move traffic in urban areas and suburban areas? Technology. Turns out if you actually care about the environment and you want to move more traffic, invest in the technology that synchronizes the stoplights, that tells you when school's out so it synchronizes the light, the on-ramps to a freeway that tell you when an ambulance is coming. The studies over and over and over and say, whether it be an algorithm or an AI, manage smart grid system for traffic is one of the most impactful things you can do to clean the air because you move the traffic. We couldn't get anyone willing here to even listen to one of our amendments on the left about promoting that type of technology. There is a biotech revolution going on around us and substantially this is happening because of what we did in that 2017 tax reform, which moved, exploded the investments. Whether it be messenger RNA, my fascination with synthetic biology, the stem cells, there are disease after disease after disease, misery after misery. We're about to cure. We know how to cure hemophilia now. We know how to, we're, I think we're on the cusp of knowing how to cure sickle cell anemia, incredibly painful disease. They're here. This place should be doing everything we can to promote getting those things to market safely and quickly as fast as we can in the misery. Oh, and by the way, it has amazing financial benefits to the economy and to our tax base. And you start to look at the innovation that are coming right now from the biotech industry. And one of the reasons I did this, and I didn't bring the other slides, then the left offers their HR3, which functionally, the economists, even on the left wing economists said, yeah, it will lower some drug prices because we're basically gonna do um, scarcity pricing, which functionally we're going to say you can't have certain drugs if it costs more than a certain amount like they do in Europe, but it will also crash the capital stock once again. A lot of you are gonna die because you're not going to get that next generation of cure. And this amazing cycle of cures that are coming goes away. Great virtue signaling. We're going to, the left will tell you they were about to do a piece of legislation to lower drug prices. And we all go, yay, because they are too high. But by the end of the decade, there's fewer cures and the value goes away. Because you didn't remove people from being sick. It's all about curing people in the misery, help bring those cures to market. Personalized medicine, let's legalize it. The fact of the matter is, I showed you the wearables, those things. The fact of the matter is, this here should be part of your ability to stay healthy. Legalize it. Mr. Speaker, may I request my time again? How much time? The gentleman has 19 minutes. Okay. Forgive me, I've been trying to talk fast not to chew it all up. So, in a couple of the pieces of legislation in the past here, we've put aside boatloads of cash to run wire to rural America. And they deserve to have internet access. I just thought this slide was amusing, but you're actually seeing it happen in Ukraine right now. See, these are a bunch of little kitties and a Starlink satellite dish, because apparently Starlink satellite dish stays a bit warm in the winter, so it defrosts itself. See, it's cute, kitties. But the fact of the matter is every inch of North America now has broadband internet. And it's a bunch of satellites that are flying over us. So let me get this straight. In Ukraine, they're now using this, the Starlink, to be able to communicate but I, we can't seem to get our brothers and sisters here in the House of Representatives to understand there is a solution to broadband all over the country. 
They just happen to be flying in low Earth orbit above our heads. It's here. But instead, we're going we're to turn around and put out billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of subsidies to put more fiber and more wire in the ground to the middle of nowhere. 